welcome. I'm going to a masquerade ball tonight, and I'm not sure what to be. Freddy Cougar? Fancy. I always wanted to be a redhead. I know. Welcome to my house. Enter freely and of your own will. Go safely and leave some of the happiness you bring. I am... Maxula. Recognize those lines? They're from Bram Stoker's classic novel. They've crept up in countless film adaptations. Tonight we're going to look at some of the greatest and strangest actors ever to play my favorite Count. Earlier in the series, we dedicated an entire episode, The Real Dark Knight, to Sir Christopher Lee. Let's have just a little taste of the Prince of Darkness in action. It's an excerpt from an EPK or electronic press kit from Dracula AD 1972. Groovy. Off to a promising start. Now the babe is Caroline Monroe. Real name. She showed up in everything from meatloaf videos to the Roger Moore James Bond film, The Spy Who Loved Me. <laughs> they didn't call him tall, dark, and gruesome for nothing, you know? Dracula, the noble vampire, and his nemesis, Professor Van Helsing. In reality, actors Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing. Here seen under the direction of Alan Gibson during the making of the latest and certainly most up-to-date resurrection. Oh, yeah. Up-to-date, baby. Afro hairstyles, go-go dancers, and loon flared trousers. It doesn't get much more up-to-date than that. Today's transatlantically successful rock group, Stone Ground by name. Yeah, Stoned Ground. It's a little more like that. These attractive party crashers. That's right, attractive party crashers, psychedelic drugs, scantily dressed women dancing on tables. Yeah, it's Carolyn Monroe again, the first lady of fantasy, certainly in low-budget sci-fi and horror movies of the 70s. Check her out at carolynmonroe.org. Truly. So what's to do but call for help? Oh, yeah. The British police force arrive in all their intimidating might. Almost any deviltry, just as soon as he gets his fangs in. Indeed, Christopher Lee has loomed all six feet four inches of him through the prize horror roles since he first lurched into dominance as the monster in The Curse of Frankenstein. He's certainly the Prince of Darkness. It's darker than the devil's trouser pockets in here. Fluent in eight languages and deriving his descent from one of the oldest Italian noble families, has been crowned Prince of Terror. He defers graciously to the late Boris Karloff as king. Christopher Lee, he's a hard act to follow. So we're going to start with those who came before him. For while Christopher Lee really nailed the role, and Hungarian Bela Lugosi sunk his teeth into it, it all started with the 1922 film, Nosferatu. This landmark piece of cinema starred an actor from Berlin named Max Schreck. Schreck by name, and Schreck by nature, and no, I'm not talking about the big green Scottish giant. This old German word, to Schrecken, means to frighten. And 90 years later, Max Schreck still casts a spooky spell in Nosferatu. The film was based very closely on Bram Stoker's novel, except that they Germanicized the names. Jonathan Harker, for example, became Thomas Hutter. He's the rather ineffectual young drip seen here enjoying dinner at the castle. Meanwhile, Count Orlock, a stand-in for Count Dracula catches up on the Transylvania Times. And this, of course, is Max Schreck as Count Orlok, Nosferatu himself. Basically Count Dracula with a change of name. And what did we say about being careful with that knife? As fans of Bram Stoker's novel will know, this scene is straight up from the book. In fact, lifting so much from Stoker's novel, it got director F.W. Murnau into trouble, and the film was withdrawn for several years. 
Blood, your precious blood. Not withdrawn as in it was shy and sat in the corner, but withdrawn as in lawyers for Bram Stoker's estate stepped in and nobody was allowed to see the film for a very long, long time. Which might not have been a bad idea. Now, poor old Orlock. All he wants to do is drain the life out of his guest's plump young body. Actually, at this stage, Hooter is supposedly still unaware that his host is a vampire. Perhaps he just likes walking backwards. Let us chat together a moment, my friend. There are still several hours till the dawn and I have the whole day to sleep. What, these are not conclusive clues for you that this guy is vampiric? Sounds nice and cozy. Cup of cocoa in front of the late show, plus maybe we can bite into a few dead rats to stave off the hunger for human flesh and blood. Sit down, relax, and I'll see what I can dig up from the cellar. Now we're cutting a long story short here, folks, skipping forward to the end of the film. As you can see, the sun is rising over the town outside, but Count Orlock here has been so busy feasting on the blood of the beautiful Ellen that he hasn't even noticed. But that's something we can all understand. How time flies when you're having fun. Actor Max Schreck was said to be a loner. I don't doubt that. He liked walking through dark forests, lost in what his contemporaries called a remote and strange world. Uh-huh. There was even some speculation that he himself was a real-life vampire. Anyway, this is Orlok's servant, Knock. As in, knock, knock, who's there? Don't play games with me, Buster. That's who's here. Max Schreck died in 1936, but five years earlier in the brave new era of talkies, another master of horror put his stamp on the Dracula genre. This, of course, was Bela Lugosi. Born in Transylvania, of all places, back in 1882, dear Bela had a colorful life both before and after he became a Hollywood star at the ripe old age of 50 in Todd Browning's Dracula. Hmm, interesting word that, annals, I mean. Not one you hear often these days. Uh, Squidward tentacles? No. I am Dracula. Yeah, Dracula, of course. A moment ago, I stumbled upon a movie. Hmm, I don't doubt that at all. Bela Lugosi played Dracula as a new type of vampire, one who dressed up like he was going to his high school prom, who was charming and went to cocktail parties. Dracula. The very mention of the name brings to mind things so evil, so fantastic, so degrading. You wonder if it isn't all a dream, a nightmare. Well, it seems like a nightmare. Yep, within two days of its opening at New York's Roxy Theater, it had sold 50,000 tickets. Millions of them. But no, this is no dream. This is Dracula. The original terrifying story of a maniac and a man who lived after death, lived on human blood, took the form of a vampire bat and lured innocent girls to a fate truly worse than death. Dracula? Oh, what? What's he done to you, dear? Tell me. He came to me. He opened a thing in his arms and he made me drink. He made me drink? I mean, he made me do things I, I'm not really ashamed of. He's back, and he's twice as bad. And just in case you haven't got the point, the name of the film was Dracula. I have taken a fancy to you, Monsieur. Silver. Now, in White Zombie, his character has the coolest-sounding name imaginable. Murder by name, murder by nature. If Lugosi got tired of being typecast as a diabolical mesmerizer, he certainly never showed it. Nope, he always stayed in focus. Er, what, except when the script called for it, of course. And then he could get all blurry around the edges with the best of them. Like, whoa, no Harley, dude. So Bela Lugosi, like, 
turns you into a zombie. That's hardcore, bro. That's like hard to swallow from the party keg of life that is, bro. But you could still take some pride in your appearance and comb the cooties out of your beard, dude. Think this is one butler about to be retired from Bela Lugosi's domestic service. Don't worry, Jenkins. You can probably still find a role in one of those British period dramas full of repressed emotions and people drinking Devonshire tea. I'm not sure if his real name was Jenkins, but it seems like a pretty good name for a butler. Seem to be ex-butler. I guess this time we really know for sure it wasn't the butler who did it. Is he still meant to be heard screaming when he's underwater? Oh dear Bela, he never did shy away from the cape and fangs. We'll have more Bela for you later. But right now, I'd like to introduce you to the Spanish King of Horror, Paul Nashi, in Count Dracula's Great Love, 1972. This is near the beginning of Count Dracula's Great Love. So let's get plotty. When their carriage loses a wheel while traveling over the Borgo Pass, the five passengers, four of whom could be Victorian-era Victoria's Secret lingerie models, seek shelter in a deserted asylum. That wheel has a mind of its own, which is more than can be said for this film. But with a bevy of bustle-wearing babes like the ones in this film, who really cares? We're gonna have to find it. Can't be too far. Can't be too far? A Transylvanian coachman with an Oklahoman accent? At least two hours. Oh, but we can't spend the night here. Well, if you're not staying overnight, I'm not watching. The gang head for the asylum, where they find the suave Dr. Wendell Marlowe. Despite being crippled by such an uncool name, Wendell bears a strong resemblance to Dracula, especially during dream sequences like these. Time after time, he'll return from his ashes, and each new life will surpass in horror the one before. Light hope lightens my heart. Yeah, the photo-negative look actually suits him. As we'll soon see, Nashi was a bit on the tubby side for Dracula. That will fall in love with a vampire in a natural way, giving herself to him without the need of his diabolical power. The blood of this young virgin will restore Dracula's evil superiority, and his life breath will revive once more his daughter, Rodna. His daughter, Rodna? I mean, who ever heard of his daughter, Rodna? I don't know what she's talking about, but she does look kind of hot in all of that fluorescent blue blood. Oh, my aching head. Just getting into it, will we? We like to tease things out on this show, so you'll just have to wait for more when we get back from this short break. Welcome back to the show. Tonight, we're looking at some of the most memorable Dracula performances in history. Right now, we're in the middle of a movie starring Paul Nashi. It's about a group of beautiful, if not too bright, tourist chicks. When their carriage breaks down, they take refuge in an abandoned asylum, whose only occupant is none other than Dracula himself. Now, although the film is called Count Dracula's Great Love, the Count does add a few notches to his bedpost, or rather coffin, before he decides which girl is actually his great love. Exhibit A. The actress is Rosanna Yanni from Buenos Aires, Argentina. And this is Nashi as Dracula. He's not actually fat, just a bit of a porky chubster to be playing Count Dracula. Not that Rosanna seems to mind. I suppose I know what's wrong. I cheated you, right? Is it so important to you, darling, that I've been with other men? Ah, oh, that old chestnut. Drac is meant to be looking for a virgin, remember? Love is much more. For me, anyway. Are you in love with someone else? No. Oh, my darling. It's not that. No, it's not you. It's me. It's the oldest line in the book, along with... Don't can't we be friends, or... I'm actually kind of a little gay. You see, at this very moment you're thinking of her. Mm -hmm. 
Eventually, however, after lots of wandering around dark corridors, Dr. Wendell, a.k.a. Count Dracula, finds his great love. And she's a babe. French actress Heidi Politoff. She arrives with cross in hand to meet with none other than the Chubster. Oh, the heck she doesn't. The old charmer. That was convincing. I love that Props got that blue together with her eyes. Everyone, including Rodma, have disappeared. And once more, Dracula asks you to share his destiny. Oh, that's different. <laughs> that can kind of make a virgin feel all warm inside. Now, what strikes the viewer as unusual about this movie is that in it, Count Dracula doesn't just go for his victims next with his fangs. Oh, no. In fact, in a number of explicit scenes, that didn't make it past our censors. The caped consumer gets things going well below the waistline. I think I know what Max would say about this. It shows that Count Dracula does at least have one thing in common with most men. That is... You don't need him around to feel good. No, I'm just kidding. That is, you can see right through him. He's completely transparent. Transparent, get it? Ah, never mind. Actress Haiti Politoff was educated at the Sorbonne, where she majored in heavy breathing. Ah, I'm just messing with you. Hot scene, hot babe, fat Spaniard. The idea that vampires sleep in coffins comes from medieval times. When villagers opened the coffins of people they suspected of being vampires, the corpses' lips were often red, and their nails and hair were still growing. But actually, that's all just a natural part of decomposition. Anyway, if you had to sleep in a coffin, this looks like a nice one. Especially with that fancy logo and sound system installed. Maids of Dracula. Dracula will Apparently, one of Dracula's many dark gifts is ventriloquism. It is you who must exchange your existence for that of his, if you really love him. Oh, and it seems like the bridesmaids from hell must have gone down to the village and brought back a human sacrifice, which is a nice touch on the Big D's wedding day, don't you think? The Prince of Darkness demands the torturing and suffering of an innocent. Then, the blood of the girl that loved the Prince of Darkness and the blood of the virgin that has been tortured will be mixed together, thereby creating a new physical body for his daughter, Radna. Oh yeah, his daughter Radna. This is some strange addition to the unusual Dracula legend and lore that nobody had ever heard of before this movie. The idea being that it is Dracula's daughter that keeps him going generation after generation. But that's not the strangest twist in this flick, which is weird even by midnight movie standards. You'll see what I mean soon enough. Meanwhile, brace yourself for some gratuitous violence. 
Ooh. Gross. I mean, ew. Gross. Perhaps the strangest part of this movie comes at the end, where our Spanish Dracula does something that no other on-screen vampire has ever dared to do. Brace yourselves, midnight movie lovers. What comes next is intense. But I can't, and that's it. She's not big on long-winded explanations, is she? I guess looking like that, she doesn't really need to be. And what a disappointment to all the fans this will be. Dracula's not supposed to kill himself. He can hang around being grim and gloomy until the end of time. Yes, fine. Brad Pitt did that when he only had Tom Cruise for company in Interview with a Vampire. And who could really blame him under those circumstances? But Dracula himself committing suicide? It's simply not the done thing. Come back. Come back? Come back? It's a bit late for that now. Count Dracula's great love must have been a stretch for Haiti Politov, a French lovely who usually showed up in the kind of Nouvelle Vague pictures where everyone goes on holiday to a chateau and get their clothes off too sweet. Now this is how the undead died back in 1972. Now is that meant to be all in one dawn? Or do the recurring shots of sunrise mean... This is like over a week. I bet he stinks, and worse than garlic. Well, what can we say except one more time? And don't say you knew we'd say that, because we'd just say great, and you weren't disappointed. Anyway, Karen decides quite the best thing after all that vampiric decomposition is simply a walk in the fresh air which is a lovely way to wrap the whole thing up, don't you think? Count Dracula's Great Love qualifies as a fine midnight movie, and Paul Nashie was great as Count Dracula. But that ending, it's almost as bad as vampires playing baseball and going on honeymoon. Not to mention any names. So the posthumous Living Dead Lifetime Achievement Award goes to the true Transylvanian, Bela Lugosi, Legend has it he was even buried in his cape. Check it out. The grief of his wife's death became greater and greater agony. The home they had so long shared together became a tomb, a sweet memory of her joyous living. The sky to which she had once looked was now only a covering for her dead body. The ever beautiful flowers she had planted with her own hand became nothing more than the lost roses of her cheeks. Hmm. Poetry. Confused by his great loss, the old man left that home never to return again. Black humor, Ed Wood style. Well, that just a minute or so more of this film roll just so you know the caliber of cinema we're dealing with. At the funeral of the old man, unknown to his mourners, his dead wife. That'd be Vampira, television's original horror and sci-fi hostess, about 60 years before Max and her midnight Tell movies. Me Why was his wife buried in the ground and he sealed in a crypt? Something to do with family tradition, a superstition of some sort. Oh. Well, it's getting dark. Let's be in our way. Yeah, why don't we go to the actor's canteen and get a little bite to eat? It's up here on the left. Then as two of his mourners left his final resting place. Ah, some people who had lunch there. 
What a way for legend Bela Lugosi to go out in a blaze of vampy, campy glory. Goodbye, and remember to keep some garlic and a cross under your pillow. Unless you're one of us, in which case you should join me at the masquerade ball.